Welcome. We're glad you guys are, are here. Thanks for joining us uh, here at the crossing. I know it's a little gross outside, so thanks for coming. Uh, you guys are joining us online. Thanks for being here as, uh, as well. We're super, super glad that you're here. If you are new, make sure you type new in the comments if it's your first time and someone will, someone will reach out to you. Um, uh, we are in uh, week two of our series, Unbalanced. And last week we were in 1 Peter chapter 1 and we learned that as Christians, we're citizens of a different kingdom. Right, that we are, we're, we're strangers here, that this, this isn't our home, right? that this place isn't, isn't our home, that our home's in heaven with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and, and his redeeming work on the cross, that's what transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into uh, the kingdom of light, into his kingdom, and that we have an inheritance, and that one day we're all, uh, we're, we're all going to go home to be with him forever. But in the meantime, we don't fit in here. We don't, we we shouldn't fit very well. And so, so when things get tough, which we know they will because we don't fit in well here, when we suffer, we, we don't suffer like the rest of the world. Right? We talked about the idea that, that, that suffering has a way of, of burning away our, the, the false hopes in our lives, the things that we lean on, the things that we look toward. Um, but it has a way of burning those away and that it allows us to see our, our true source of hope. Right? It burns all the false things away because they... they they, they don't hold water. They can't support us. They can't give us the hope and the, and the joy that we need uh, to, 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 to live life the way God would have us to live. And that's only found in Christ. So when we suffer, that's what it does. It refines us, burns away those false hopes, and allows us to turn our hope toward the only place that we, can, that we do find true joy and hope. And that's in uh, Christ and his saving grace. We suffer, but we have hope because we have an inheritance. Right? A hope that leads to joy because we know that, that our inheritance, that it's in heaven, that it's guarded by God the Father. I mean, ain't nobody going to take something away from God the Father. You know what I'm saying? So, so we know that it's safe. So when we suffer, we suffer differently than the rest of the world. And this week, we're, we're going to pick up right where we left off. Um, we're not going to work through First Peter. We're going to do that at another time. We're not going to work through the whole book. But these two passages squared up really well, so I figured we would just walk through them uh, back to back in a back-to-back week. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the passage that we just read, if you haven't done that already. Um, uh, turn to First Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 13. And here's what we're going to do this morning. We're just going to walk verse by verse through this passage and just see what, uh, what, what God wants to teach us. So uh, in First uh, Peter chapter 1, Uh, Verse 13, it says this, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As his obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. So uh, we just talked about that Peter just finished encouraging the suffering Christians in, uh, that were scattered throughout the region of, of, of Asia Minor. And now he's moving moving on from that encouragement to, uh, to instructions for living. In this passage, and he begins this passage with the word therefore. And I've talked about this before, but anytime you see therefore in scripture, no matter what you're reading, what passage, where it is, anytime you see therefore, stop. Okay? Stop and go back. Okay? Because anytime you see therefore in scripture, you should always look before, okay, to see what it is that they were talking about. Okay, to see what, so they talk and then they say, therefore, this. Well, what does this mean? This holds context in what was written before. So go back and read before, before you read therefore. You follow, y- y'all track with me? You got that? Okay, so that's the idea. When you see the, uh, before, when you see therefore, look before, okay? All right, anyways, so I've already gone through what we talked about last week. Peter says we're citizens of a different kingdom. We have a hope because we have an inheritance and our inheritance allows us to endure suffering with hope and joy. Okay, that's that, that's that, in, in, that passage in a nutshell. So, so Peter's saying that everything that follows Everything, everything that I'm fixing to tell you in the Southern term, everything that I'm getting ready to tell you um, is, in, uh, is as a result of what is written in what I just told you in verses 1 through 12. Okay, it's all based on those verses. So um, he's saying, get, get ready. Here it comes. This is what I'm going to do. So this isn't a because I said so scenario. Okay, this isn't Peter saying because I said so, you're going to do these things. Okay. Um, anyone ever, uh, anyone remember arguing with their parents growing up and they pulled the because I said so card? Anyone? Okay. All right. So, uh, that's, that's like the, that's like the parenting trump card, right? Um, that, that's when, uh, well, that's when I knew that my mom didn't have a reason, right? I, mom, can I go over to Tommy's house and spend the night? No. Why not? Because I said so. You don't have a reason, right? You just didn't want me to go. Now I'm, you don't want me to be happy, 
That's what you wanted. You wanted me to be miserable at the house with you. Um, no, now, <laughs> she didn't have a reason. Or as I've learned, now that I'm a parent, I have totally pulled the trump bed. I've totally pulled that card out, and I realize. Um, but what I've learned is that usually that means that they just, she just didn't feel like getting into her reason, right? But at the time, I felt like when somebody says, because I said so, they didn't have a reason. This isn't one of those situations. Peter's saying, therefore, because of the hope that's available to you, because of your identity as a citizen of heaven, because of that, this is what should be happening in your life, Okay. This, uh, and he says, therefore, be sober-minded. Peter tells them to be sober-minded. He says, to be alert to the world around them, to not, not walk around blind to what's going on around us. And the idea here isn't, the idea here is, is that we see things as they really are. Not as, not, not as the world thinks it should be, but we see things as they really are. And I talk a lot about uh, spiritual warfare from up here, um, that, 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 that there's a war raging around us. I, and it's because I'm trying to get us, not because I want us to, you know, to, I don't know, run out and beat people up with a Bible or anything, but it's because I want us to, I, I want us to get an understanding of, of, of the stakes, guys, that this is serious business. This isn't just something that you do with your family on Sunday mornings, all right? The Christian life is serious business. Scripture says that, that the road to heaven is narrow, and that few people find it. Doesn't say that everybody finds it. Doesn't say that the majority of people find it. It says that few people find it. There is an entire world of people out there, guys, that, who don't know the saving grace of Jesus. And if they die, they're gonna spend eternity. They're gonna spend forever separated from God. And it's up to us. It's up to us. To, to see that that narrow road to heaven is as crowded as possible, okay? This is a serious business. I want you guys to become a problem for the kingdom of darkness. Like, when you change jobs and you walk into that new office, right, that doesn't have any believers in it, where the kingdom of darkness has a foothold, I want Satan minions to see you coming and be like, uh-oh, here comes Bethany, right? We better, get, we better get some reinforcements, right? That's what I want us to do. I want you to be a problem for Satan. But in order for us to be able to punch Satan in the mouth, we need to be sober-minded, right? We need to, we need to see our world for, for what it really is, for, that, that it's a battleground between, between two kingdoms, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. We need to be alert and aware to what's going on around us. We can't fall asleep on the job. We need to see things as they really are. We're sober-minded, and then Peter says that, that we should be focused on our grace, to set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. We set our hope on the saving grace that we're given through Christ. Right, That grace that we receive as a result of what Christ did on the cross. Let me ask you guys a question. <coughs> What person in your life is the hardest on you? Who makes you feel the worst about yourself? I guess that's another way I could put it. Isn't it you? Right, I mean, I know there are toxic people in our lives. Okay, we know that. And we should, you know, you should deal with toxic people in your lives. But no one, <coughs> at least in my life, no one says, no one says stuff to us or, no, like, like we say to ourselves. Right? I mean, I'm my own worst critic. Based on some of the things that I say to myself, I, I don't think I'd be friends with myself if, if I was another person. I'd be like, you're mean, dude. You're a jerk. But, but guys, we have been given grace. So much grace. We are forgiven as a follower of Christ. Yep. Yes, we, we make mistakes. And hear me tell you, those mistakes aren't okay, okay? They're not okay. But those mistakes are already paid for. We hinder our work in the kingdom when we dwell on them, right? And, and, and it allows Satan to use, it, it, he, he, we allow him to use those things that, that, that we do, the mistakes that we make. We allow him to use those to make us feel unworthy or unqualified to get into the battle, okay? And that's the goal. 
Satan wants us out of the picture. We're not gonna be a problem for him if we allow ourselves to be set on the sideline because, because we made a mistake. That's why we set our hope on the grace that we receive. Always walking forward saying, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I know I made a mistake, but I am forgiven. We set our hope. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. We choose to set our hope. We tend to become what we allow ourselves to dwell on. Okay, and so, so why would we wanna dwell on things that, that upset our spirits, right? That's why we set our hope. We make the choice to dwell on the grace that we have in Christ, right? Why would we, why would we want to dwell on things that, that, that are gonna upset our spirits? And I'm not just talking about negative self-talk, okay? I'm not just talking about like beating yourself up when you make a mistake. The, the conviction of the Holy Spirit's a real thing, but the conviction of the Holy Spirit says, you know what? Turn to God, repent of that. Agree with God that you messed up because he already knows that you did right? Agree with that and say, you know what? I'm going to do better and turn and, and start to live your life, okay? To move forward. I'm not just talking about negative, negative self-talk. I, I mean, turn on the news, right? It's just one bad thing after another, one frustration after another. I had to stop. It's what we, what we take in. I had, to, I had to severely limit. I don't want to say stop because that's not 100%, but I had to severely limit the amount of talk radio that I listened to because I'd get so aggravated, Right? I'd leave work here in a great mood. I'd be like, time to go home. I'm going to hang out with the family. I'm going to do my thing. And I'd turn on talk radio and uh, on my way home. And by the time I got home, by the time I, from the office to my house, by the time I got there, I'd be so mad that I had to get out of the car and like go sit in the barn for 15 or 20 minutes so I could like cool off before I could spend time with my family. Right? We, we, have, we have a choice over what we think about, guys. We have a choice over where we set our hope on what we dwell on. Having the indwelling Holy Spirit gives us that choice, okay? We do have a choice. Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there is, if, uh, if there is in anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Things. That's the choice. We choose hope. Guys, we choose to dwell on the hope and the grace that we have in Christ and everything else that points us in that direction. That's where we choose to let our minds live. It's garbage in, garbage out, folks. And we put to death any thought or anything else that would have us direct our attention elsewhere. When that thought comes in that you're not good enough, when that thought comes in that you're mad about whatever or this, that, and the other, we take it captive and we deal with it. We put it to death, we set it aside, and we choose to dwell on the hope that we have in Christ. Let's keep reading. Uh, in uh, verse 15, it says, but as one who call, as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. So with our minds set on the grace and hope that we have in Christ, we live holy lives. I said this last week. I just said it a second ago. You're forgiven. You are righteous. You are holy. When you came to Christ, you were washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the call to be holy here, it is, it isn't a <coughs> it isn't a call, uh, uh, it isn't a call to 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 uh, to positional holiness. Okay? It, it's a call to transformational holiness. Let me explain. Um, positional holiness is this. As sons, uh, as sons and daughters of God, we're, we're, we're washed clean through the blood of Christ, right? He paid the price for our sins on the cross. We share in Christ's holiness. So when God looks down from heaven, he sees us, but he sees us through the blood of his son, right? So Jesus imputes, this is the churchy word for it, imputes his righteousness to us through the blood that he shed on the cross. So as a child of God, you are holy. And as holy as you can possibly be, you're never gonna get any holier. Okay, you are as holy as, as you're gonna get, okay? Because you share in Christ's holiness, because Christ is holy. Positionally, God sees you as clean. He sees you as, as spotless. That's the miracle of grace, okay? 
Peter is talking about transformational holiness here when he says to be holy as I am holy, okay? The ongoing process of sanctification in the life of a believer. We've talked about that before, right? The process, um, the, the process of the Holy Spirit refining us here in this place, right? Making us more like Jesus in this life as we go from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, right? Becoming more like Jesus. It's a lifelong process because Jesus was perfect and you're not, Right? And neither am I. So so as long as we're standing on this planet, as long as we're here, there'll be things that the Holy Spirit will need to change about us. doesn't matter if you've been been a believer for two days or 25 years, right? There will always be things that need to, that need to change to make us more like Jesus. So we're always, all of us going to be in process. Hear me say that. All of us are always going to be in process, and our conduct is going to bear that out. How we live our lives is gonna bear out the sanctification of our lives as we move forward as believers, okay? That's why here at The Crossing, we love everyone who comes to those doors. Every single person, because they are no different than we are, okay? They're in process too, just like we are. Okay, we're, we're, and they're in process too, but you know what, they, we're, all, we're all at different points along the journey, okay? We're all holy, cleansed by God, but we're all working toward becoming like Jesus every single day, and some of us are a little further down the road than others. That's all, we are all still in process. Like I said, we don't condone sin, but we do welcome all sinners. Because we believe that Jesus can do a life-changing work in Anyone. He can take the most busted, sin soaked person and transform them into a holy, redeemed child of the living God. I mean, he changed you, didn't he? Right? He changed me, and he's going to continue to change you because you're still a sin soaked, busted believer, right? The only difference is now you've got the Holy Spirit in your life making those adjustments. Your sins are just a little different now than they were when you first came to Christ. That's sanctification. Guys, we need to extend grace to everyone because you don't know their story. You don't know where they're at in the process. But we're all in process. With that said, you can't take... uh, (coughs) You can't take your Christianity on and off like a jacket and expect to see God move in your life. That's why our conduct matters. What we do matters. We are redeemed positionally. We're holy positionally. But the process of sanctification, it plays out in how we act. It plays out in what we do. When it comes to our conduct, when it comes to sin, um, I think sometimes we ask the wrong question. Right? The question that we ask is, 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 is this a sin? Like, that's the question. Like, that's the question I ask myself. Is this a sin? Is this thing? Is, is this a sin, God? And we ask that question when I think what we should be asking is, does this thing, whatever this is, does this glorify God? And here's what I mean. Um, when it's late at night and, and I'm looking for something to watch on TV after everybody's gone to bed because I stay up entirely too late, um, and I come across that show that everyone's been talking about, Right, it's a great show. Everyone's like, the show's fantastic. You need to check that out. Except for the sex and the murder and the constant themes of betrayal and revenge. Right? Is it a sin for me to watch that? That's not the question. I should be asking, will watching this show glorify God in my life? That's the question. You see, when I frame it that way, the answer is, to not just the television shows that I watch, but to all the conduct in my life, the answer becomes pretty clear. Will this glorify God in my life? That's the measuring stick, not is this a sin, not how close to the line can I get in whatever this thing is before I cross over into sin. It's does this bring glory? Is this glorifying God in my life? And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to be legalistic here, guys, but, but we're part of a different kingdom 
Scripture puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You start in verse 14. It says, for what partnership is there between righteousness and lawness, lawlessness? Or, or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or, or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Guys, we have nothing in common with the world. Right? We're called to live a different kind of life. That word Belial means the devil. We're supposed to have nothing in common with the devil. That means that we do things differently, that we have a different way of, of that we have a different way of handling anger. When we're mad, when we're angry, we don't respond the way that the world does. That means that our sexual ethic is different than the world. We don't approach relationships the same way that the world does. It's different. Remember I talked about uh, last week that we're viewed, sometimes we're viewed as, we can be viewed as an obstacle to progress just simply because of what we believe. This is the kind of things that we're talking about. Our sexual ethic is different. Our view of submission to authority is different than the world. We, I, our view of, of personal rights is different. The world says, this is my life, it's my right, this is my right, I've got the right to do whatever. We're called to die to ourselves every day for other people. That doesn't fit the world at all, guys. Right? We, we, we consume media differently than the rest of the world. We shouldn't be able to consume the same trash that, that the world watches and then walk away from it thinking, you know, except for the cruelty, betrayal, sex, and language, that's a fantastic show. But that's what we do, isn't it? I've done it. Remember, guys, we become what we dwell on. I'm not saying that you can never watch TV again, guys, right? I'm, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is that we need to be sober-minded when we do, when we approach a lot of these things, TV just being the one that came to my mind, right? We need to be sober-minded when we do, aware that what, that what goes in, that what we take in leaves a mark on us, whether we're aware of it or not. Parents, let me ask you a question. How well do you monitor your kids' online activity? Do you know what they're being exposed to? I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't gamed, you know, gamed in years, but, um, but I, was, I, was, I was pretty into it, into the whole, the whole thing, when online, game, online gaming was becoming a thing, right? When it was first starting to happen, that's when I was kind of into it, right? And I remember uh, playing games with, with folks from all over the world. It was really cool. You know, you got the little headset on, you're talking to them, and they're talking back. Um, and even back then, Okay, we're talking 15, 20 years ago. Even back then, I can tell you that most of what I heard wasn't what I would call uplifting. Okay? It wasn't food for my soul. Okay? Um, and some of it was downright evil. Now, look, I'm not, <laughs> hear me say, I'm not telling you to go home and take your kids' game systems away because they'll hate me forever. Okay? That's, that's, that's not what I'm telling you uh, to do. Please don't do that. But to think that they can sit there, or that you can sit there, if you're into the gaming thing, that you can sit there and expose yourself and allow them to, be, allow them to expose themselves to the trash that folks are saying and doing on their screens over and over again and not be affected? Guys, that's just not the case. When I was in college, um, I played tennis in college, right? And uh, and I remember um, when I first came onto the team, I first joined the team, I was in school, I was working at a church leading worship, and <clears throat> I was the only American on the team, okay? And so um, all these guys are from, uh, most, most of the guys were from Brazil, had a couple of guys from, from France, and they were learning English when they got there, you know? And um, apparently the first thing that you learn how to do uh, when you're learning English um, is to cuss. And so um, that's what I was around five days a week, like three and a half hours a day, five days a week was these guys in broken English saying every combination of cuss word that you could think of, right? Phrases, and it didn't even have to be anything bad. They could be in a great mood. You know, they weren't even because they were angry. They were just exploring the language. Let's put it that way, right? But that's what I was around all day, every day, okay? Um, now, I, that, that wasn't my thing. I'm, I'm not, I was trying to keep control of my tongue and all of that. But I can tell you that um, after about eight months of this, right, being on the team, and I, was, I, didn't, I didn't join in with him or anything like that, um, I was, uh, one Sunday morning, I was, and I, want to, I don't want to hope you all don't change your 
opinion about me. I'm just being real, okay? Um, I was leading worship, and we get done with the worship set, okay? We get done with the music, and uh, I turned around to take my guitar off and set it on the, on the stand, so I had my back to the congregation. And when I turned around, somebody had moved a cable back here, and I tripped over the cable, okay? Like, you know, one of those. And I was holding my guitar, which was a very expensive piece of equipment, and it scared me to death when I went, because I thought I was going down. And I'll tell you what came out of my mouth was not praise God, okay? I let it go. First thing, first word that came to my mind is what came out of my mouth. And the entire worship team was like this, okay? The congregation didn't hear it, right, because I had my back to them. Guys, I didn't have time to even think about what I was going to say. But because that's what I had been around for months, what I had been exposed to over and over and over and over again, for me to think that didn't affect where I was, my gut reaction when I got scared or when something happened was for that to come out of my mouth. You can't tell me this stuff doesn't leave a mark, even when you're not aware of it. What we let into our lives, it affects us. And, and, and not all at once. It's a slow fade. Right? It's, it's one choice here, it's one choice there, it's a small thing. And they seem innocent enough, but over time, they dull our spiritual senses and then they slowly draw us away from God. That's why, it's, that's why we're called to be sober-minded and, and seeing the world as it truly is. That's why that's, that's the call. But seeing it is just the first part of the solution. In verse 17, Peter says, if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. Conduct yourselves in reverence. Paul gives them the solution, right? He says, that, that word reverence can also be translated fear. And we've talked about this before, but, but, but the fear of God isn't a state of being afraid of him, right? It's, it's not cowering in fear of, of God. It's a picture of awe and, and, of, and, and of respect, so he's saying that if we appeal to God, that if we call ourselves believers, if God is the one that we turn to, if he's the one that we cry out to, if we call ourselves followers of God, then we live, we're to live in a constant state of awe and respect for, for who it is that we worship. I wonder if this is one of the areas that, that, that Western Christianity as a whole has fallen victim to the slow fade. Um, in an effort to make Christianity more appealing to people, to maybe to, to make it more, more, more attractive. Um, we've made God uh, primarily a friend to sinners, okay, because he is. But we've made him, we've shifted our focus, I feel like sometimes, that, that to, to him primarily being a friend to sinners. And in the process, we've taken away his lordship. Right, we, we focus so much on God's love for us that we put his holiness and his might on, on the back burner. You guys remember the, the bumper stickers used to float around, God is my co-pilot? Anybody remember those? Guys, God's not anybody's co-pilot. He's not. He's, uh, he's not. He's the creator of the universe. He's clothed in righteousness. He's the alpha. He's the omega, the beginning and the end. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. And he won't be reduced to riding shotgun in anyone's life. Sorry. I got carried away. Um, but it's the truth. Guys, he's worthy. He is completely worthy of, of our complete devotion, awe, and sub submission, and respect. And Peter's saying that we are to recognize that. If we call God our Savior, if we say that we worship him, we need to recognize who he is and conduct our lives with, awe and res with that awe and respect that, that understanding, as best as we can understand it, of how great and mighty and powerful God is, with that always in view. Everything that we do is through that lens of who God is and how, how much he loves us. Yes, he's a friend to sinners. Praise God, I'm forgiven because of what Jesus did. But that doesn't change who he is. Mighty and powerful and worthy of my awe and respect. The answer to the slow fade in the life of a believer is to live in a constant state of awe and reverence to God. And then Peter gives them some, some family-specific instruction in verses 18 through 25. And I just want to read this, and, uh, and then we're going to talk about it, and then we'll be done. Verse 18, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like an unblemished and spotless lamb. 
He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. Because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the, flower, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. You hear, you hear him rehashing verses 1 through 12 in this? He's like, I've already told you, but I just want to remind you just in case you've forgotten before I give you the rest of this. I love the fact that people need to be reminding because I need to be reminded all the time. So I love the fact that Peter felt the need to remind the believers in Asia Minor. He's told them how to live lives set apart in the world. And now he's telling them how this plays out, right? He's saying, in the world, this is how you live life. You live a holy life. You live set apart. You live differently than the world. Now he's telling them what this looks like in the church. Now he's like, in your faith family, this is what it looks like. And he spends the first several verses just reminding them of who they are. In case you forgot, this is it. This is who you are. Redeemed, cleansed, children of God. And because of that, because of the hope that you have, because of all that, you, the redeemed blood of Christ, like that you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Remember, we talked about this last week. It's imperishable that Christ's redeeming sacrifice, our inheritance is imperishable. It'll never fade. It'll never waver. You can't out God's grace, hallelujah, Right? that we're God's children and no force or power can ever take that away because it's guarded by God himself in heaven. Through Jesus, we've got hope. That's their focus. And then Peter, uh, and Peter knows that they've come to this understanding, right? This isn't just hypothetical. He knows that this is where they're at. He's telling them where they already are and they know where they are. He says in verse 22, since you have purified yourselves by obedience to the truth, he's like, you're doing this. You're already doing these things. Everything I just wrote, to, everything I've just told you, that's where you're at. I know that's where you're living. They've come face to face with God's truth in their lives and they've allowed it to change them. The Holy Spirit confronted them just like he confronts you and me with our sin, right? And, 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 and confronted them with their need for a savior and they said yes. They, they, they responded. They didn't argue over it. They didn't cast it aside. They submitted to it. They submitted to God's truth in their lives. God's word, guys, the Bible, is unapologetic about its call in our lives, right? The Christian life isn't easy. We're not called to live easy lives. And the Bible doesn't apologize for that. We're called to lay down our lives every day, to submit to the Holy Spirit in everything, not just in a part of our lives, in all of our lives. And Peter, in this particular case, gives them one specific way that they can lay down their lives in the context of the family of faith. He says, you're doing it, guys. You're submitting to God's truth in your lives. It's awesome. I see it. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love each other. Verse 22, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. Love each other and do it constantly. Just like we don't take our Christianity on and off like a jacket, like we can't do that as followers of Christ, we don't start and stop loving one another in the family of faith. We do it all the time, right? We love every single day. And loving folks, I mean, well, it's easy when we're all getting along, right? When you're getting along with everybody, it's all love. We love each other. Give me a hug. Good to see you do the man thing, you know, where you do the two pats, the handshake and the two pats, right? Like, that's easy. When everything's in order and as it should be, when we're all getting along, when you're not getting on my nerves, right? Loving is easy, but to constantly love one another is a different story. What about, what about when you're being stupid, right? What about when you're just wrong? I mean, it's hard to love someone who's always wrong, right? Always arguing with you back and forth. You know they're wrong. I mean, I'm never wrong, at least in my own opinion, right? So I'm, it's hard. I can tell you it's hard for me to love people that are always wrong when I'm in, in relationship with them right? The, <laughs> the kind of love that Peter's talking about here isn't friendly love, okay? That's not the idea. It's brotherly love. I tell engaged couples in marriage counseling all the time that family is forever, that, um, that you're marrying into a family and they will be your family forever, 
for better or worse. And that's the idea here, that we're in this forever. This, this kind of love, guys, that Peter's talking about is sticky. It's a sticky kind of love. We're stuck with each other, folks. That's, that's why our hope in Christ and, 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 and grace for ourselves, the grace that we find in Christ and to one another is so important. We receive that grace from Christ and then it's our job to extend that grace to other people. To receive grace from God, to say, I'll take that forgiveness, God, I'll take it, thank you. I know, you know I didn't mean to make that mistake, but I messed up, so I'll accept that grace. And then to not extend it to other members of the family of faith is the definition of hypocrisy. To be willing to receive grace from God and not extend it to that person in your life that, let's be honest, is wrong. To not extend that grace is the definition of hypocrisy. Because if we can't extend grace to one another, just like God extends grace to us, guys, this thing, this thing, this family of faith, it won't work. And notice, I love it, notice that Peter didn't say that they should like one another constantly. Right? Some of y'all are like, thank you. Right? There's a difference between like and love in the family of faith. I don't have to like you in order to love you. Anyone here know Christians they don't like? You can, don't lie, put your hand up. Y'all know, I have everyone in this room, uh-huh. Thank you very much, right? I know I do, I've got a list. I'm just kidding, I don't have a list. In my notes, I've got careful written in all capital letters right here. <coughs> No, guys, look, loving one another doesn't mean that we're all best friends. We don't have to hang out on the weekends together, we don't, but, but we don't dismiss one another, okay? We don't write each other off. There's no such thing as I am done with that person in the life of a Christian, okay? But, but we don't have to be best friends, okay? We're, we're called to love one another because we're all on the same side, that's why this battle thing that we've been talking about is so important. We're, we're citizens of the same kingdom and we're all in the same family. We're on the same side. We're in the same battle, okay? So we pray for one another and we support one another. We extend grace to one another. Our call is too important not to, but that doesn't mean that we have to be best friends. We're not all gonna be best friends, but we all need a few. We all need one or two people in our lives who are willing to step up. And as one pastor um, that I like said, um, we need one or two people that are willing to step up and go shield the shield with us. But we need people in our lives who are willing to challenge us in our walks with God, okay? To love us enough to tell us when they see us getting off track. And I would say that it probably works better if these folks aren't your best friends, right? Men, let's talk. Who do you got in your life that's willing to tell you when you're not loving your wife the way you should be? When you're, when, when you're not taking your walk with God seriously. Now I'm talking to all of us, right? But I, I say men uh, because this is an area that I think many of us don't do very well in. It's easy for us to try to go, try to go it on our own, to do it alone, because we're men, right? But we need people to step into our lives to, and to step up to the plate and to go shield to shield with us. I challenge you guys today, men and women, everyone, to find your few. Find one or two people. They don't have to be your best friends, but they do need to love you enough to step into your life and say, I see this. I mean, you might wanna, you might wanna redirect that a little bit. I think you're sliding off track a little bit. To lean into each other and then guys, watch what God does. You'll walk away from those conversations mad, okay? I guarantee you'll walk away mad because the nature of truth is it always offends before it corrects. But you take what they said, you lean into it, and you watch God change your life. You watch God grow you up. Guys, we're, we're called to live holy lives that mark us as followers of Christ, not living a life of do's and don'ts, okay? That's not the idea here, but a life of awe and reverence that causes us to live differently, 
That's what, because of what, that's what God's calling us to do because of who he is. He's calling us to live a life for his glory and our good. That's why in Psalm 16, it says, the boundary lines, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Guys, God doesn't call us to holiness because he wants to take away our happiness. That's not the idea. The boundary lines aren't there to take away our happiness. The boundary lines are there because he calls us to holiness because it will bring us true hope and joy. Maybe you've been living outside those boundaries. It's time for you to confess that and to move back inside the life that God is calling you to do because within those boundaries is life and freedom and hope and joy. As we close... Guys, we have to love one another. I know I've gone long. I'm looking at my clock here and I'm sorry. Um, But uh, guys, we have to love one another in this family. Our things are hard. We're strangers out there. In here with this family is where we find the encouragement that we need to go back out there and to live the lives that will draw other people's back in here toward Christ. We have to love each other. If there's someone that you need to go to and set things right this morning, please do that. And the way you know that if there is someone like that, as soon as I started talking about this, that person came to your mind, just so you know. Um, Scripture says that you need to fix what's wrong in a broken relationship with another believer before you come to God's altar and worship because he won't hear your worship, right? You fix it first, then you pursue worship. Extend that grace. Confess what needs to be confessed. Forgive what needs to be forgiven. Extend that grace that you gladly receive. Remember that we don't all have to be best friends, but we're, we're, we're called to love, and we're called to love constantly from a pure heart. As we sing, we're gonna have some people at the crosses, and if there's something that you guys need to deal with, if there's a relationship that needs to be fixed, I encourage you not to wait until tomorrow. If you have to wait till tomorrow, go ahead. But I encourage you, if there's something you need to deal with with another believer in the family, deal with it now. Fix it now. Don't put it off because something will come up and you'll put it off till next week or the week after. Deal with it now. You don't have to be best friends, but you can agree in the Lord. Maybe the Holy Spirit's been moving in you and there are some things in your life that you you say, you know what, this doesn't glorify you. I don't know necessarily that it's like a sin, but at the same time, I know this isn't bringing glory to God in my life. Maybe that's something you need to just walk away from. Maybe you need to make that commitment this morning. As we sing, there'll be some people standing at the crosses. They'd love to pray with you about any of this stuff if you'd like to do that. Um, I encourage you, spend some time in prayer. Ask God to speak, ask him to move in you and then respond to what it is he's telling you to do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the grace that is given to us repeatedly, the grace that is poured out. Thank you for the forgiveness that's found at the foot of your cross. God, thank you for our family of faith. And Lord, I ask you this morning, God, I ask you if you would give us, Father, if you would give us a view of you, if you would give us, uh, Lord, uh, help us to see the reality of the